In the Jewish calendar, there are three regalim, three festivals. Two of them are seven-day festivals, which are Sukkot and Pesach. And one of them is a one-day festival, but really it's two days ever since the fourth century. Uh, in the diaspora, it's been a two-day festival because in the diaspora, all festivals are two days at a minimum. And that is, of course, the festival that's upcoming in a week, Shavuos. And as we'll see today, it actually has multiple names. Shavuos is the most common name for it. Shavuos means weeks. Of course, there is this weeks that separate Pesach from Shavuos, this uh, seven weeks comprising seven days, 49 days. The 50th day is Shavuos. And there is an intimate link between Pesach and Shavuos, which is maybe why it's called Shavuos. Uh, but there's many other names that, that also highlight various other aspects of the holiday, as we will see. And it's upcoming in a week. This year, it's going to be on Sunday and Monday upcoming, the sixth and the seventh day of the Hebrew month of Sivan. And it commemorates the day that the Jewish people stood at the foot of the mountain at Mount Sinai. Mount Sinai is a mountain somewhere in the south. Well, we don't really know exactly where it is, but according to most opinions, it is in the south of what's today the Sinai Desert or the Sinai Peninsula, which if you look at a map and you look at where Israel is and where Egypt is and separating the two is this kind of large triangle-shaped peninsula, the Sinai Peninsula. It's basically a desert. It's got lots of mountains. And somewhere in the south of that tip, the tip of the peninsula, is um, the most commonly agreed upon location of Mount Sinai, even though that is disputed. But regardless, they stood at the foot of Mount Sinai. And they had an experience that was never replicated in history and never existed prior, never happened since. A monumentous occasion, arguably, not arguably, I think I'm quite convinced, it's the most significant event in all of human history. It's a national revelation where an entire nation, a nation comprised of 600,000 adult males, you would assume a comparable amount of females, many, many young people up to the age of 20, elderly, beyond the age of 60, essentially a nation comprised of millions experiencing prophecy together and surviving to tell the tale. This is an event that, as the Torah in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 4 predicts, that never will happen, never happened, and in fact, no one will ever claim that it happened, even falsely, because it's not possible to claim such a thing falsely. You can't get millions of people to agree on a false lie, on a hoax, that they experienced prophecy that had God taught to them. That's never happened, never will happen. And if you actually can understand where it fits in history, so it's the Jewish people left Egypt on Pesach, which is the 15th day of the month of Nisan. They travel out, with men, women, children, with lots of booty as well. And after a couple of days, Pharaoh decides to, uh, to, to chase them. They end up uh, backed up to, to the sea. And seven days after they leave, they have the, ma- the miracle of the splitting of the sea. The Jewish people enter the sea. The water miraculously makes way for dry land. The Jewish people walk in the dry land amidst the sea on both sides. Pretty remarkable. And then the Egyptian says, hey, we'll follow. And the water crashes down upon them and almost no one survives. Afterwards, the Jewish people travel to various places. Uh, Their food stock runs out. And they're in the middle of the desert. And there's millions of people who need to be fed. And miraculously, God parachutes TV dinners to every family in the form of the manna, which is just amazing miracles, they're, they're cocooned by this magnificent mountain-flattening clouds by day and a pillar of fire at night. They have moshos and constant communication with God. They end up in the city of Mara. Mara, they don't have any water to drink. After three days of no water, they start complaining. So we like to look at the fact that they're complaining, when in reality, they only started complaining after three days of no water. So that kind of puts it in a different light. They complain. God shows Moshe this stick. He throws it into the water. The waters become sweet. Everyone is, has enough to drink. And there in the city of Mara, this is a couple of weeks after they left Egypt, they get a few mitzvos. The verse tells us uh, that sham sam lo chogu mishpav sham niso. There God gave us some laws and some statutes, and there we were tested. And this is interesting because this is the first time 
that our nation has received any mitzvos. Of course, if you go back to Genesis, you'll see the mitzvos, the Noahide mitzvos given to Adam and to Noah. Uh, Abraham is commanded with circumcision. Isaac, Abraham, Isaac, and, and Jacob, they all built altars to do sacrifices for God. Jacob is told about the mitzvah of not consuming from the sciatica, the parts of the animal that we're not allowed to eat, even in kosher animals. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob also pray. And our sages tell us that Abraham, he instituted the morning prayer, Isaac, the afternoon prayer, and Jacob, the evening prayer. The Rambam adds that while in Egypt, the Jewish people were commanded or certainly Amram, Moshe's father, was with other mitzvos, what the identity of those mitzvos are, he doesn't tell us. In Egypt, the Jewish people are commanded uh, to maintain a calendar, and uh, the mitzvos of uh, the pastoral offering, the Pesach offering, which they did in Egypt uh, the, even before they left. Uh, but once they leave, now they're forming as a nation. They're in Mara, in the city of Mara, and God gives them a few mitzvos. What those mitzvos are, Talmud tells us in the book of Sanhedrin, that they are honoring your parents, the mitzvah of Shabbos, uh, the mitzvah of the red heifer, uh, uh, a few mitzvahs, a few motley mitzvahs of mitzvahs that they're given in Mara. And finally, on the first day of Sivan, they encamp as a nation, a nation as one, with one heart, with one purpose, at the foot of this mountain. Three days later, God tells Moshe, God's in communication, we're planning out this event that's going to happen. He tells them, I want, instruct the people to separate from their wives, to clean their clothing, to prepare themselves for this incredible event that's going to happen on the sixth day of Sivan. And on the morning of Sivan, there's all – the Torah describes in very vivid detail. I encourage everyone to read the account just in the Torah in chapter 20, really 19 and 20, essentially through 24 of the book of Exodus. Uh, of course, in the middle, you have the Mishpatim, so it's a little bit confusing because it's told partially 19 and 20 and then really jumps to 24. But also, additionally, in chapter 4 of Deuteronomy, it revisits the Ten Commandments and gives a description of what happened. And the reason why I encourage everyone to read it in the book, like your teacher told you in fourth grade, don't watch the movie, read the book. The movie has to uh, cut out some details and add some embellishments and take some poetic license. It's quite clear in the Torah that it wasn't just God speaking to Moshe at Sinai and the Jewish people were were separate. The actual Sinai experience that day of the Ten Commandments is national prophecy to everyone. Moshe and everyone are on the same plateau of prophecy hearing directly from God. Afterwards, Moshe goes up the mountain, goes up to heaven, uses the mountain as a portal to heaven, and spends 40 days in heaven hanging out with angels, negotiating with angels, arguing with angels, but essentially getting the Torah from God. And the Talmud gives very vivid descriptions based upon verses in the Torah that describe what Moshe actually did there and what he experienced and his negotiations with the with the angels. And the angels wanted to burn him and they were so flummoxed by his existence. And he had to prove the legitimacy of his claim to the Torah. And then the Talmud also describes that Moshe is watching God writing a Torah scroll and he's all confused by these crownlets above the letters. And he asks God, well, why, why are you making all these embellishments? If you look at the Torah scroll, you'll notice that there's certain Letters that have upon them these crownlets, these jots and tittles above them. Why does God have to make these beautiful illustrations above the letters? And God says, well, Rabbi Akiva is going to live in about 1,500 years, and he's going to deduce piles and piles of laws, not just from the actual content, the words, but also from the crownlets above the letters. And Moshe is teleported 1,500 years into the future, and he sits in Rabbi Kiva's lecture, and he doesn't understand what's going on. And he goes back to God and says, why are you giving the Torah through me? Give the Torah through Rabbi Kiva. And then Moshe says, okay, I want to see his reward. And God shows him that the Romans flank his fight. It's a crazy thing what Moshe sees there. We get all these descriptions of what Moshe does in heaven. But again, all that is predicated on Ten Commandments, which Moshe is still here, and we're all, the whole nation, men, women, and children, are experiencing prophecy here the Ten Commandments. And then afterwards, Moshe goes up the mountain. God makes this path amidst the clouds. Moshe goes up and disappears into the mountain, into heaven for 40 days and 40 nights. The whole nation goes back to the camp, and only Joshua is there at the foot of the mountain waiting for Moshe to come down. Of course, when Moshe comes down, 
the whole nation's been waiting now for 40 days, but they make a miscalculation. They say, okay, 40 days, let's start counting. But Moshe, at the day that Moshe went up, because it wasn't a complete day, didn't count. It was 40 full days. And they counted only 39 full days on the 40th day. They assume he's here and the, then it doesn't show and they think he's dead. They're quite convinced he's dead. And in fact, the Satan comes and makes it look like he is dead and they freak out and they try to look for a replacement. Eventually, the idolaters that arose with them from Egypt, they do some sort of uh, black magic and they are able to convert a bunch of gold into this little mobile drone, this little little golden calf, and things kind of spiral out of control, and Aaron tries to stop it, and doesn't quite go as planned, and the next day Moshe comes down, he's holding the godly tablets, and he sees Joshua at the foot of the mountain, but he hears these voices, these noises of revelry from the camp, and they're like, what is it? Is it a war? What's going on? But Moshe, that's what Joshua thinks. Moshe says, no, 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 this is, this is, this is, we got a problem. And uh, they, of course he goes and he takes the tablets and he crashes them onto the ground when he sees the revelry and everyone's dancing around this golden calf. He takes the golden calf itself, he grinds it into dust, puts it in the water, makes everyone drink from it. The instigators die from consuming the water. He tells the Levites to grab their swords and attack all those people who participated. Eventually, 3,000 people die. And Moshe spends the next 40 days trying to get God to allow the nation to not be decimated, to not be destroyed. And 40 days later, he goes up for a third time to the heaven, this time with man-made tablets and God agrees to give him the Torah once again, and he comes down on Yom Kippur, and the day after Yom Kippur, they start building the Mishkan, the tabernacle. That's a broad overview of, of the history and the story. But back to Shavuos. Ten Commandments, a momentous national experience. The Jewish people are temporarily elevated to the stature of prophets, prophets to the degree that they saw, they experienced at Sinai visions and prophecies that even the great prophet Ezekiel was not able to see. Says the Talmud, Ra'asa Shifcha Alayam, a maidservant who was at the splitting of the sea, saw more than Ezekiel. All the more so at Sinai, the whole nation is elevated to this highest level, or not maybe not the highest level, but a very high level of prophecy, and that is what we are revisiting every year on this festival. In fact, on the morning of Shavuos, we actually read the Ten Commandments narrative uh, because that is relevant to the festival. Now, the actual title, the, the title that we say in the prayers, in the liturgy of the festival is Zman Matan Torah Seinu. It is the time of the giving of our Torah. This is the time where the heavenly Torah that was in the upper spheres was transferred to us. You know, the, the existence of Torah philosophically is, a, is a, just an incredible idea that the Torah that God used to create the world, the Torah that existed before the world was created, that Torah, the Torah that really originates from the heavenly spheres is in our world and teaching us mortal humans, humans that really are similar to animals in a lot of our constitution, it teaches us how to become like angels, which is just a remarkable thing. The heavenly Torah is now in this earthly realm, in this earthly sphere. And that really began on this festival and therefore that's what we celebrate on this uh, on this day. And I think maybe a good way to kind of dig into some of the themes or, or maybe the core themes of the festival is to ask the following question. We know that the Torah contains 613 mitzvahs. Right? The, the mitzvahs of the Torah, the commandments, the practical applications of the lessons of the Torah, they break down to 613 mitzvahs. Now, to be fair, uh, there's a famous idea brought down from the Gon of Vilna's brother. He writes that really these 613 mitzvos are categories. They're not isolated mitzvos. There are many subcategories within every mitzvah. 
but 613 general categories. Now, if you do the math on Shavuos at Sinai, we received around 3% of those mitzvahs because out of 613, we got 10. How much did we not get? We didn't get 603. So if you do the math, we got about around 3%. And the question, I think, that's, that warrants investigation, and maybe there's many answers, as we'll see, but certainly a question that's worthy, worthy to think about is, wait a minute, okay, it's the time that we got the Torah, but w- how much of the Torah did we get? 3%? In fact, there's, there's days in the future, in, the, in Arvos Mov, in the plains of Moab, where in single days, or certainly in, in single settings, we got so many more mitzvos. You read like uh, the Parsha of, of Kisetze in, in the middle of Deuteronomy. There's like 74 mitzvos in one Parsha. It all happened and like there's a lot more mitzvos given in one setting or one sitting even. Why are we making this day as the day of the giving of the Torah when we got relatively a small amount of its mitzvos? Now, perhaps you may argue that, well, yes, we didn't get all the mitzvos, but we started getting the mitzvos. Well, that's also not true. What happened in Mora, which was several weeks prior, we got three or four mitzvos. So we started getting some mitzvos. So it wasn't the beginning, when, like we said earlier, this mitzvos that we got, the seven Noahide mitzvos, the seven universal mitzvos, the mitzvah, the day that Abraham was commanded in circumcision. Why don't we celebrate that day as the giving of the Torah? You may argue, well, a national, we got it as a nation, not as individuals. Well, we got those in Mara. We don't even, do we celebrate the, da- the time of Mara? Do we celebrate that at all? Uh, and of course, it's important to stress, maybe this is obvious, maybe it's not, that the entire Sinai experience, and we know the Jewish people only left Sinai on the 20th day of ER on the following year. So if they arrived on the first day of Sivan, the year of the Exodus, they left Sinai in the 20th day of ER, so it's 10 days shy of a year they were at Sinai. They were there for a long, a long time. And in fact, the part that we just read, Bahar uh, and Bukhul Kosai, it stresses that the, you know, this is at the end of Leviticus, they're still at Sinai. So all of, the, all of Leviticus is still conveyed at Sinai. And they only leave Sinai uh, a year, almost a year after they get there. Now, and they spend the rest of the 40 years traveling throughout the wilderness in various different locations and encampments, 44 in total. But the Torah that they're getting is entirely oral Torah. The written Torah is not given until the very end of Moshe's life, where Moshe writes down 13 copies of the written Torah and delivers one to each tribe, and one of them is kept for posterity in the Ark of the Covenant, along with several other things, notably the both sets of tablets, uh, Aaron's staff that sprouted almonds, a vial of manna, but and then these scrolls were used by future generations to copy and make their own their own their own copies of, of Torah scrolls. Every tribe was given one Torah scroll, and the thirteenth scroll was kept for the Jewish nation. And for centuries, the Jewish people had the actual Torah scrolls written by Moshe's hand, perfectly accurate versions, and that's what they would use to copy to make copies of them. Uh, but the the Torah, the actual written written Torah, didn't didn't wasn't delivered to the Jewish people until the end of forty years. The Talmud, of the Book of Gittin, page sixty a, has a debate: How was the written Torah written? Was it written incrementally? which means that at Sinai, the Jewish people, God tells Moshe, okay, right until the middle of Exodus, and then after each section of Torah and story and, and narrative and mitzvahs were commanded, God told Moshe, okay, write that uh, incrementally, or was it all written at the end? Which means that at Sinai, they wrote up, Moshe wrote up to, up to Yisro, up to Parshish Yisro, up to middle of Exodus, and then he wrote it, the completion at the end. But everyone agrees that the Written Torah was only given to the Jewish people when Moshe died. So, just again, to clear any misconceptions, the Jewish people did not get scrolls at Sinai. In fact, you would imagine, you know, if Korach had an advanced copy of his episode, 
you don't imagine he would uh, actually say, oh, what should we do right now? Uh, let's, 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 let's consult the book and find out how to best mess up my legacy. Another example, Aaron's sons would certainly not venture into the Holy of Holies with a foreign fire. Of course, uh, those things were only written after they happened. But certainly, the written Torah comes after the oral Torah. So this is, this is something I think is important to stress and might kind of upend. I know a lot of people, not people, even people that are well-versed in Torah, they have like the story backwards. They think that the oral Torah is there to serve as the written Torah. When in fact, the opposite is true. And if you look at it historically, the Jewish people were given the oral Torah and then they were given the written Torah, not vice versa. If most people, regardless of level of knowledge, or they would say, well, the oral Torah is there to explain the written Torah. And that technically is true, but really it works the other way around. Really, the oral Torah is there to service the written Torah and not vice versa. Because Moshe, what is Moshe doing? Moshe is telling them, you read any section in Leviticus or numbers. Moshe, God says to Moshe, go tell the Jewish people X, Y, and Z. What does Moshe do? Moshe goes and tells them, he gathers the whole nation and teaches them mitzvahs, teaches them laws, teaches them the laws of, of a sukkah. Well, what does a sukkah look like? How big is it? How tall is it? What's a, what, what, are the, what are the walls made of? How many walls do you need? He, that's what, he's telling them the actual application of those laws. Maybe he also tells them, well, the verse says that you should sit in the sukkah for seven days, but he also explains what that means. Afterwards, they're given the written Torah as a way to kind of give structure and framework and also to ensure that no mistakes fall into the oral tradition. Um, so again, ironically, it's almost the exact opposite of the way people formulate it, that the oral Torah, yes, it is there to explain the written Torah, but actually it's more the other way around. The written Torah is there to help ensure that the transmission of the oral Torah tradition is done flawlessly. Just as an aside, I said something right now very quickly, but I have a whole podcast called Torah 101 dedicated to kind of these kinds of questions, understanding the structure of Torah, the divinity of the Torah, the interrelationship of written oral Torah. It's only 11 episodes, about an hour each. Uh, And I advise everyone who wants to really understand how these things work to give it a listen and send me some feedback at rabbiwolby at gmail.com. So again, so the written Torah was not given to the Jewish people until later. And that's just important to, to understand in the structure and the history of the giving of the Torah. So what did we actually get on Shavuos that makes it worthy of being considered the time of the giving of the Torah, not just the Torah, the whole Torah? So I, I have five answers to that question. Maybe there's more. I don't know. But uh, last time I talk, spoke about this, I only had four answers. So maybe there's more. So I think that the simple, maybe the most simple answer is that Yes, we got the Ten Commandments, and that was pretty groundbreaking, and pretty dramatic, and and memorable. But right after Ten Commandments, Moshe goes up to heaven, and he goes up into the other world, the spiritual world, and he's going to go get the bulk of Torah. Of course, we got some mitzvos earlier, certainly. But even those mitzvos that we got earlier, they were repeated to Moshe, uh, and Moshe told it to the Jewish people as as a whole. And when did Moshe kind of go up to this world, to the spiritual world, and get the entirety of the Torah and bring it down to the Jewish people? That happened at Sinai on this day. After the Sinai experience, after the revelation, after the Ten Commandments, Moshe travels up the up the mountain and goes, uses it as a portal to heaven, goes up to heaven, and God's there and teaches him the whole Torah. And then he comes back down ostensibly with a plan to deliver it to the Jewish people. Of course, it doesn't exactly work out as planned. He has to navigate the perils of the golden calf and God threatens to destroy the Jewish people and start from scratch. And of course, things don't go as planned necessarily. But this is the time where this confluence of worlds are happening. Moshe is going up to heaven, a human is traveling to the world of angels to get a heavenly Torah to bring it back to humans. That's what Torah is, and that's when it really began. And therefore, yes, there were some mitzvahs, isolated mitzvahs given to us earlier, and Moshe didn't deliver all those mitzvahs for the whole 40 years. He's teaching the mitzvahs to the Jewish people. Of course, but when did this time of the giving of the Torah, when did it begin where the heavenly Torah is now going to be given to humans, that began on Shavuos, and therefore it is appropriate for us to consider it as a day of the giving of the Torah. That's the first answer. Another answer. 
if you'll notice, if you read it quite critically, and the Talmud points this out in the book of Matros on page 23b, but really at the top of 24a, that there is actually a difference between the first two of the Ten Commandments and the ensuing eight. Why? The first two of the Ten Commandments were given by God directly to the entirety of the Jewish nation. And the Talmud even describes how it was too much for the Jewish people to handle. They died. They came back to life. They were blown 12 miles yonder. And then they had to be brought back. And this was like an experience, like God's giving the Ten Commandments. But really, after two, Jewish people tell Moshe, okay, you give it to us. We can't handle this. And Moshe delivers the final eight with his voice being amplified by God to the entire nation. Now, there's an obvious question here. If the Jewish people can't handle the Ten Commandments given by God, and after one, they're like, this is way too much for us. But only after two does Moshe take over. I don't get it. If they can't handle one, if they can't handle two, why can't they handle ten? And if they can't handle one, well, how do they end up having two and then two but no more? So one of the commentaries on the Talmud of uh, of Matos in page 24a, 23b and 24a, uh, the Maharsha, 16th, 17th century. And he writes something very interesting. He writes that essentially all of Torah can be condensed to the first two of the Ten Commandments. The first is to believe in God, to have a Muna, And the second is to not have idolatry, to not believe in any foreign gods. God is the number one priority and there's no other priorities which are higher. And essentially, all 248 positive mitzvos are just applications of the principle of the first of the Ten Commandments. Well, what does it mean to believe in God? Well, what are the details of listening and obeying the will of God? 248 positive mitzvos. What are the details of not disobeying God? 365 negative restrictions, commandments of what we're not supposed to do, what God does not want us to do. And thus the first two essentially incorporate the principles of all of Torah and we got those directly from God and we had to hear those specifically from God and we had to make it through two because essentially what we're getting is God gives the entire Jewish people all of Torah. The details, of course, are fleshed out by Moshe and through prophecy. But really all of Torah, we got the Jewish nation got directly from God. Now, how to apply it, we needed some help. But the essence, the core of it, we were – given to, by God, and we have to be given all that by God, and therefore, really, all of Torah is condensed into the first two of the Ten Commandments, and therefore, all of Torah, the principles of Torah, the two principles, the idea of belief in God and the idea of eschewing idolatry, all of that was given at Sinai. Now, it's important to stress what that means is that every positive mitzvah, that's an affirmation of faith. It doesn't matter what it is. It could be uh, a mitzvah of sending away the mother bird, which doesn't seem to even connect to God at all. But because someone is doing it, because God instructs um, him or her to do it, therefore, that is an essentially an affirmation of their belief in God. Whereas all negative mitzvahs, it could be something which is even interpersonal, like not to have unequal weights. That seems like it's totally interpersonal. It doesn't do with God. Has to do with don't, don't you know be a good person to other people, but because it's part of the bulk of the uh, of the Torah, if someone transgresses that, that is akin to idolatry because they are disobeying God. They are choosing something else against the express will of the Almighty, and therefore it is like idolatry. That was the second answer. The second answer is that the first two contain all of Torah. It's indeed a very highly condensed version, but it's all of Torah, and therefore we got all of Torah in kind of. One fell swoop at Sinai and therefore over the next 40 years, the duration of the Torah is fleshing those out. The third answer as to why Shavuos is a day of the giving of all of Torah kind of is the same, similar answer, but it's slightly more expansive. And that is that the Ten Commandments, one through ten, comprise a condensed version of Torah. If you look at Rashi's commentary uh, in Exodus, Rashi quotes the Rabbeinu Sa'ad Yagon who writes that the Ten Commandments contain all of Torah. And in fact, there is a uh, a poem written by Rav Sa'ad Yagon, who's one of the Gaonim, the most famous of the Gaonim. The Gaonim are the Jewish sages who led the nation from the 6th to the 11th century. 
in Babylon. And Rav Sadiqo wrote a poem in which he categorizes all 613 mitzvot into 10 categories, the 10 categories of the 10 commandments. And therefore, yes, these are 10 mitzvot in isolation, but in principle, there are 10 categories, which includes all of 613 mitzvot. And therefore, yes, we got all 613 through this Ten Commandments experience at Sinai, we got all of Torah at Sinai. The Midrash writes something really interesting. If you count the letters of the Ten Commandments, you'll have 613 letters, plus seven for the seven days of creation, which essentially is telling us that this idea that Ten Commandments, it's 613 mitzvot plus the principles of faith found in the seven days of creation – it's really everything, but it's a very condensed version. Therefore, it's hinted by the amount of letters that are needed to tell us of the Ten Commandments. Thus, again, it's somewhat of a similar idea. Not just the first two, but all ten comprise the the body of all of the entirety of, the, of, of all of Torah. And therefore, we got all of Torah at Sinai by the Ten Commandments. Alternatively, we, could, we can say that there's 613 Torah mitzvot and there's seven rabbinic mitzvot. There's many rabbinic edicts and decrees and fences, but there's only seven rabbinic mitzvot, new mitzvot, um, amongst them saying the Hallel, uh, lighting uh, the menorah, lighting Shabbos candles, laws of Eruv, um, reading the Megillah on 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 Purim, the seven rabbinic mitzvot, and that would also equate to 620. But that's the uh, third answer. A fourth answer is a little bit more about what the Torah wants us to become. And my grandfather would speak about this uh, extensively. And the way he would present it is by looking at the final mitzvah of the Ten Commandments. And that is lo sachmod, thou shall not covet. Don't desire the good things that your neighbor has, his wife, his ox, his house, his car. It doesn't say his car, but that's what it would say today. His iPhone, whatever it may be, don't covet anything. Anything that your fellow has, don't covet it. Don't even desire it. And it's a very fundamental teaching brought down by the Ibn Ezra, one of the medieval commentators on the Torah. The Ibn Ezra asked the question that maybe we should all ask. His question is, wait a minute. In this mitzvah, the Torah is not telling us that we shouldn't act in a specific way. It doesn't say, don't act upon the desires that you have in your neighbor's stuff. It says, don't even desire it. And his question is, wait a minute. How can the Torah legislate desires? I shouldn't even desire it. What if I do desire it? How is that within the realm of feasible instructions that I shouldn't even desire the night? He has nice things. He's got a nice wife, a nice house, a nice car, a nice phone, a nice ox. It's really nice. And therefore, it's, it seems like it's only natural for someone to covet. And it seems unreasonable for the Torah to tell us not to covet. That's his question. And his answer is just a amazing idea which is very fundamental to all of what the Torah really wants us to get at. And he gives an analogy. He gives several analogies. One analogy is if you have a peasant, an illiterate peasant, his father was a peasant, his children will be peasants, they're peasants forever. They're the lowest strata of society. And then he happens to be in the capital city and he manages a glimpse of the beautiful princess, rich powerful, beautiful, the princess. Wow. He gets to see her. Says the Ibn Ezra, if someone is healthy, if this, if this peasant is of sound mind, he won't even desire her. Of course, he'd love to have her, but he knows that there's no way, it's not possible in any context for him to actually marry this woman. So therefore, he doesn't desire her. And he gives another example. He says, if someone's healthy, a human who's healthy, doesn't desire to sprout wings from their forearms and to be able to fly like a bird. Maybe if someone is mentally unwell, they would desire that. But if someone's healthy, they don't desire it. Would it be cool to have wings and fly? That'd be awesome. You could be able to avert traffic. You're about to show off to your friends. It'd be really, really cool. Who wouldn't like that? But you don't desire it because you know it's not possible.
So what he's telling us is that desire and lust, coveting is not blind. You don't just desire things that you think would be cool to have. You only desire things that you think would be cool to have and you think that it's maybe possible for you to get it. That's his point. It's possible for it to be obtainable in some fashion. There's some way for you to get it. Only then do you desire it. Therefore, what the Torah is telling us in the mitzvah of thou shalt not covet, it's telling us is that you should really believe in God to such a degree that your belief in God, your faith in God should become greater than your faith and your belief in the inflexibility of biology. And you should be so convinced that God is manipulating the world and God gives you what you need and God gives your neighbor what he needs, that that should become so fixed, it changing that should be more unreasonable than growing wings out of your forums and flapping around like a bird. And therefore, what the Torah is really commanding us, the ultimate culmination of the first of the Ten Commandments is the last of the Ten Commandments. It begins, believe in God. That's kind of like a theoretical idea. And, of course, that's the beginning of someone's relationship with God. But what's the ultimate culmination? What's the end game of Torah? The end game of Torah is that becomes so fundamental it actually changes your perspective on how you see the world and it, it's the lenses through which you see everything. And therefore, everything that you encounter, you say, okay, well, well what does God say? That, that's kind of the first order of business. And therefore, when you see your neighbor's stuff, you recognize that God gave it to, to, to your neighbor, not to you. And therefore, you don't even desire it because it's, it's crazy to desire it. It's like trying to have wings. It's just not possible. And therefore, what actually we see in the Ten Commandments, it's not just ten mitzvot, but it's also a description of the process that the Almighty is giving us in Torah at, at large, a transformation in our relationship with God and thus our relationship with how we see the world. We start off with the theoretical abstract idea, there is a God, he created the world, but also took us out of the land of Egypt and is in charge of everything. But that's kind of like a theoretical idea. That's how it begins. And over the course of Torah, which mapped out by the Ten Commandments, we're trying to reach the end game, which is to have that actually change the way we see the world. And through that new perspective, we won't covet because it's so unreasonable, just like the guy who doesn't want to, even though it would be cool, doesn't want to grow wings. I mean, doesn't even think about it because it's just, it's not, it's without, it's outside of the realm of the potentially feasible. So too, we shouldn't covet what God decides belongs to our neighbor. That's the fourth answer to our question, that the Ten Commandments actually outline the, the process, the transformation that the Torah in general wants us to undergo from theoretical abstract faith to more tangible, instinctive faith, as evident by the last, the final Ten Commandments, thou shall not covet. And finally, a fifth answer is that the Ten Commandments experience is evidence that Moshe's a bona fide prophet. It, it, it boosts or it secures Moshe's credentials for all eternity as being a prophet. And the explanation of that is found in the actual run-up to the Ten Commandments. In chapter 19, verse 9 of Exodus, God tells Moshe what the plan is for the Sinai experience. And Hashem said to Moshe, Behold, I am coming to you in the dense cloud, in order the nation will hear why I speak to you, and also on you they will forever believe. What this is telling us is that there is a change in the way the nation relates to Moshe that happens at Sinai, at the Sinai experience, that forever alters his stature as a bona fide prophet for the Jewish nation. Now, the way to understand this is to look back at the splitting of the sea several weeks prior. At the splitting of the sea, the nation erupted in song, and the way the Torah, uh, the way the Torah introduces that is that the Jewish people believed in God and believed in Moshe. That's in chapter 15 of Exodus. Chapter 19, God tells Moshe, oh, the nation will believe in you as well. Because I'll speak to you in the thickness of the cloud, the nation will believe in you. And the obvious question is, well, well, wait, wait a minute. 
if the nation believed in Moshe already prior, what is going to change at Sinai that they believe in Moshe forever? And the answer is, is that they believed in Moshe, but they believed in Moshe as a result of the miracles that he orchestrated. And that is one level of belief, belief because of miracles. Whereas at Sinai, there's going to be eternal belief in Moshe, not because of miracles, but because of being together with Moshe as he is experiencing prophecy, to listen in on God's conversation with Moshe, and therefore to remove any doubt that could potentially be there with result of faith based upon miracles. I advise everyone to look at the Rambam in the 7th and 8th and ninth chapters of Yesode HaTorah, the foundations of Torah, where he goes into great detail and explains the difference between Moshe's prophecies and the prophecy of all other prophets. And then he adds, the reason why we believe in Moshe is not because of all the miracles that he did, not because of the Spanish Sinai, not because of the Ten, Command, uh, the Ten Plates, nothing. The reason why we believed in Moshe is because at, this is a quote, Bemamar Har Sinai, at the Mount Sinai revelation that our eyes saw, not, we weren't told by someone else, and our ears heard, and not because we didn't hear secondhand. We saw the, the fire and the sounds and the torches and Moshe goes up into the cloud, and we hear the sound of God, the voice of God speaking to him, and we hear Moshe, Moshe, go tell him this and this, and as it says, God spoke to you face to face, Ram is reminding us that the Ten Commandments experience was God's prophesying, prophesying to us specifically, and other verses, it wasn't God speaking to our forefathers, God was speaking to us, and that's why we believe in Moshe, and he quotes the verse in 19.9, the reason why God is speaking to Moshe at Sinai is not necessarily because of the content, the actual Ten Commandments. As we see, the rest of the Torah is given to God through Moshe to, to the nation. So why do we have to have this different format? It's to prove for once and for all that we believe that Moshe is legit because we experience prophecy alongside of him and we heard God speaking to him. And therefore, that is going to remove all doubt and therefore, Moshe in Deuteronomy, 40 years later, gives, gives us mitzvahs. Well, how do we know it's really coming from God? Maybe Moshe's making it up on his own. Well, we know Moshe's a real prophet because we ourselves were privy to his prophecy at Sinai. So again, this answer, it doesn't address the content of what we experienced at Sinai, but rather the method that we experienced it in. We experienced a prophecy alongside Moshe that forever proves that Moshe is a real legitimate prophet. Moshe is the father of all prophets, those that come before him and those that come after him. How do we know that Abraham is a prophet? Because Moshe tells us. How do we know that future prophets are prophets? Because Moshe lays out the parameters of prophecy. All prophecy stems logically from our belief in Moshe because that we experienced ourselves and it's not belief based on miracles or the like. Therefore, the Ram elaborates this point, comes along some future prophet and says, well, let's get rid of one of Moshe's laws. Well, his prophecy is only based upon the fact that Moshe told us that he's going to be a prophet. Or his prophecy is only based upon miracles. And therefore, that's not on the same high level that Moshe has. And therefore, in order to uproot Moshe's prophecy, you have to come with at least equal uh, firepower, which no one will have. And therefore, the Torah of Moshe stands for him. And he writes, he's like, if J.C. comes along, let's assume J.C. is a prophet. Let's just assume for argument's sake that he is. Comes and says, and gets or Paul or whatever. The second you try to say, well, I want to get rid of any loss. I want to get rid of any of Moshe's prophecy. You can't do it. Because even if you are a prophecy, you're a lower level prophecy based upon miracles. You cannot put a higher level prophecy based upon a prophecy like Moshe's that was proven by testimony of millions of people at the foot of the mountain who experienced prophecy alongside of him. That's a much higher level of prophecy. That's a prophecy that's not able, you can't dupe the nation into believing that that's true. And therefore, all the Torah and our belief in the divinity of the Torah in its entirety, not just what happened at Sinai, but what happened subsequently, is all substantiated by the experience of Sinai that forever proved that Moshe is legit. Thus concludes the answer to our question, but I think it does give us a lot of different facets of this festival. It's Yes, it's about Torah, it's about the Sinai experience, and it is the first step of our immersion into Torah as a nation. We got mitzvahs before, we got mitzvahs afterwards, but this is really where it all begins, this is where it all stems from. This is also giving us a picture of the transformation that Torah is trying to 
to to orchestrate within us. It is the time that is important for us to think about as uh, as just to answer the question of how do we know it's all true? Like the verse says in chapter 4 of Deuteronomy, no other nation even – let's assume it's false. Well, why have uh, no other nations made up the same lie that we did? Are we just better? You know, we run Hollywood, I guess. Uh, yeah. It's possible that we're able to – uh, pull wool over everyone else's eyes that no one else can. But again, that's a very weak argument. So again, there's a lot of themes that we revisit on Shavuos. Now, there's other facets of the festival that are important uh, to to note. So first of all, like we said earlier, there's many different names for this festival. In the Torah, it's called Chag HaKatsir, the, the festival of the harvest. And there are all kinds of agricultural undertones to this festival. So, for example, the Torah tells us that on the second day of Pesach, we bring the Omer offering. It's a, it's a barley offering. And on Shavuos, we bring the Shte'alechem, which is a wheat bread offering. And this, again, of course, it's it's like a sacrifice. It's an offering that has to be understood in the context of all offerings, but like we said at the beginning, there is a certain connection between the beginning of the Exodus experience that happens at on Pesach and the culmination, the climax that happens uh, at Sinai on Shavuos. And the Ramban, in fact, writes that there is this connection. It's almost as if it's one big holiday, one big festival, the festival of the Exodus that begins with Pesach and, con- and concludes uh, with the giving of the Torah at Sinai on Shavuos. But this con- connection between these two offerings, the barley offering and the wheat offering, it, it does seem to have a connection. And one of the answers given is that like this is like this period is really trying to show us what we're trying to achieve as a nation. This is like the, the, the national description of the mission of the Jewish people. It begins with the Exodus and then we kind of earn it with the 49 days of the Omer, which correspond to the 49 days facets of, of, of humanity, and they conclude with the 50th, with the supernatural on Shavuos. And some of the commentaries note that if you look at these, the, the bookends of these festivals, you have a barley offering at the beginning and a wheat offering at the end. And in all of Jewish scripture and literature, barley is associated with animal food, and wheat is associated with human food. And this kind of shows us what this transformation we're trying to become. Uh, humanity, humans, are a blend. We're a blend of, of, a, of animalistic body and a spiritualistic angelic soul. And this transformation, becoming, of, of starting off like an animal, so to speak, of having instincts that are bodily, that are mundane, and trying to become more human-like, more angelic, more distinct that's really what we're trying to accomplish as a nation and a very, very big picture and as certainly as the, the objective of Torah that we're given to kind of secure and maintain. It's the tool to become a human. That's what you would say maybe, the, to become a human in, in the Torah sense, a perfect human. Uh, that's what Torah really is. And I, maybe we can even argue that all this uh, agricultural undertones – they have a lot of overlap with this idea. Uh, we're told in scripture, Ha'adam eats hasada. Man is a tree of the field. And again, there's a lot of ways to understand that, but maybe the most simplistic way is that in our hearts, in our hearts, there, there are roots that are invisible. And just like a tree, a tree, it has to have roots that are invisible. And what you see is only a manifestation, a reflection of what you don't see. And in fact, if, if you have a tree that has doesn't have roots, then it's going to be knocked over. And that's kind of similar to our spiritual makeup that we're supposed to have. We're supposed to have it within ourselves, within our hearts, within a, invisible for everyone else. We're supposed to have what's called a, a spiritual internal world that has to be as deep and as broad as what we're manifesting to the world or else what is manifested to the world is very weak and a wind comes and knocks it over. And that's, again, a very broad Jewish idea that 
your spiritual persona that you show others is only as strong as the spiritual internal relationship that you have with God and with Torah and with other people that is invisible to others. And in fact, there's another, again, another agricultural component to this festival. It's called Yom HaBikurim, the day of the Bikurim. Bikurim is from the word Bechor, which is firstborn, uh, which means that it's the first fruits you're supposed to bring the first fruits to Jerusalem to consume in Jerusalem to thank God for God's kindness. When does that begin? When is the kickstarting of the mitzvah of Bikurim, of bringing the first fruits to Jerusalem, begins on Shavuos? Again, similar idea to, uh, to that. In addition, in the Talmud and other Talmudic literature, the festival is called Atzeres. Now, Atzeres, well, that word, it's not so clear what it means, but Rashi and the Ramban say that Atzeres is the word Atzor, which means to stop and reflect. And in fact, in the Torah, there's only one day it's called Atzeres, which is called Shmini Atzeres, which is the day after Sukkot. And Rashi, quoting from the Talmud, tells us that after this communion that we have with God on the seven days of Shavu of Sukkot, we have one more day. God says, stop, don't leave, don't leave, stop one more day. It's hard for him to depart from us. Let's have just one more day to be together. And the obvious question is, wait a minute, if, if, if the Jewish nation and God are so close together, we're cocooned in the Sukkah, it's like we're recapturing the relationship that we had with God when we're surrounded by the mount, by, by the clouds of glory, and God says, oh, just one more day, only then can we leave. Well, what's going to be the following day if God can't depart from us? And he says, give me one more day. Well, what's going to help? We're just kicking the can down the road. What's going to happen the next day? God won't, can't depart from us. We'll just kick it down the road again. And you'll, have to, you'll have to continually add one more day. And perhaps the answer is, and this is what I heard from one of my uh, teachers in yeshiva, that this final day, it's a day of dedication that's going to ensure a connection between the nation and God, that even after God departs, so to speak, that connection will continue. That the objective of this last day of Sukkot, this day that's a, a appendage to Sukkot, Shemini Atzeres, the eighth day, which is the Atzeres, it's dedicated to kind of ensuring that the relationship that was fostered during the first seven days of Sukkot is concretized and strengthened that it will continue in perpetuity even after the holiday uh, con- concludes. Shavuos is called Atzeres too. Perhaps we could say is that this is again a culmination of what began really with Pesach and what was strengthened throughout the Sefirah Omer. It's we had this infusion of a relationship with God at the first night of Pesach, and then we lost it, and then we try to earn it back, and then we have Atzeres. This is this day, this fiftieth day of Sukkot, which is trying to foster a relationship and a closeness with God that will be so secure and so strong that even after Shavuos is over, it could continue. And that, of course, there's nothing that binds us to our Creator more than us studying His Torah. And that's why you have this whole whole day of, that's dedicated to Torah study and to reflection of the Sinai experience, which kicked off this Torah conveyance of God to, to us, and that will hopefully ensure that the continuation of the relationship will be uh, will will go on even after the festival is over. Another aspect of this festival is that we read the book of Ruth. And again, there's many many reasons given for this custom. Ruth is one of the five Megillos that we have. There's five of the twenty four books of uh, the twenty four books of the Tanakh of the Jewish Bible, five of them called the Megillas, uh, Eicha, Lamentations, Esther, the Book of Esther, the Book of Ruth, the Book of Kehelas, Ecclesiastes, and finally, Shir Hashirim, Song of Songs. We read them all throughout the year. On, on Shavuos, read the Book of Ruth. Why do we read the Book of Ruth on Shavuos? It does have a lot of these agricultural components to it. That's maybe one answer to it, to that question where, where Ruth goes and she uh, she's collecting uh, wheat, from Boaz, uh, and she, of course, becomes the great grandmother of David. But an answer that I heard from my grandfather to explain this, we know that Ruth was a convert. 
And not only that, she's presented as the the most the archetype of a righteous convert, of someone who's willing to give up everything, a life in the lap of luxury to be part of the Jewish people, and yearned more than anything to join the to join the Jewish nation, even at great personal sacrifice. She was a Moabite princess. She married the high society of the Jewish nation, the, the Machlon and Chilion, the, the sons of Elimelech, who had to flee or fleed from Israel because he wanted to escape the, uh, the famine that was there. I would advise everyone to read the story of the Book of Ruth. It's a great story. Um, but the story goes briefly that uh, her husband died and her sister who married one of the brothers as well, Arpa, uh, they decide they want to join the Jewish people. Ruth heads back, uh, Naomi, the mother-in-law, heads back to Israel. Uh, she's now destitute, and even though she was very wealthy, she lost everything, lost her children, lost her husband. And then Ruth and Arpa say, okay, we're joining you. We're going to become part of the Jewish nation. And she's like, ah, why would you do it? Am I going to have any more children that you want to marry? It's just, you know, you're, you're giving up a lot. You're forfeiting a lot. Go back to your family. And Arpa says, you know what? Sure. And she turns around, then she heads back. And Ruth says, no, I'm going to stick with you, whatever it takes. And she's all in. And she goes, and they're living in poverty, even though they had, both of them were very wealthy. And eventually she um, she marries Boaz, who was very elderly at the time. But they're only together for, for one night, and she becomes pregnant. And she uh, is going to have a child. His name is Oved, who is the grandfather of David, because his son is Jesse, Yeshai, and that's David. And that that kind of one act or one life of commitment and dedication to the Jewish nation makes Ruth one of the great heroines of Jewish history. What does it have to do with Shavuos? So my grandfather said that really what she did mirrors what the Jewish nation did at Sinai. At Sinai, which is really the culmination of the Exodus, the Jewish nation converted and therefore, there were people who were not part of the biological family of the Jewish nation. Notably, of course, Moshe's wife, Zipporah. She was the daughter of Yisro. She wasn't a descendant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob like, like Moshe was. But because she was there at the Exodus and the ensuing weeks of the founding of the nation, she became Jewish alongside everyone else. And therefore, the process that culminated at Sinai was akin to conversion. And therefore, when... We want to kind of memorialize that. We read the story of Ruth, who is the archetype, who is the paragon of what it means to convert. It means to say goodbye to your previous life, to abandon a little bit of your previous identity and to adopt a new one. That's what Ruth did. That's the Jewish nation. That's one answer. There's many other answers. There's also a custom to, to eat dairy on Shavuos. Now, I want to stress, there's a mitzvah in the Torah to celebrate the holiday. Says the Talmud, what, what does it mean to celebrate, to be joyous? It means to have meat and wine. So there's a custom to eat dairy, but there's a mitzvah to eat meat. So, which is why it's important for you to kind of not, don't lose out on the actual mitzvah. I'm not forcing, there may be some vegans amongst us. Does it, again, so maybe you made, made that up by having wine or whatever, but there's a mitzvah to eat celebratory, a celebratory feast on Shavuos which is ideally done with meat and wine, but maybe you can have one dairy meal as well to fulfill this custom. But why do we have this custom? Again, there are so many answers to this question. I'll just give a few. Uh, the classic answer is that Jewish people at, at Sinai, they they needed to start now to start obeying the laws. Now they're obligated by the laws. Well, well, one of the laws are the laws of kosher. Well, how do you have kosher? You have to have slaughter the animal kosher fashion. You have to have kosher pots. Day of Sinai was Shabbos. You can't slaughter any new animals. And you can't ca- kosher your pots. And therefore, all they had was dairy. And we kind of revisit that with consuming of dairy. Torah is compared to milk. There's a verse that says to that effect, just like milk is able to sustain the whole body, a baby, all they have is the mother's milk. Similarly, Torah is able to sustain the whole soul. Another answer. Uh, the gematria, the numerical value of milk is, uh, the Hebrew word is chalav, which is equates to 40. Moshe is up the, on the mountain for 40 days. And there's 40 generations from Moshe to Rav Ashi, from the beginning of the giving of the Torah to, to the end, from the beginning of the giving of the oral Torah to when it's finally written down in the Talmud, 40 generations. Uh, also, Moshe, when Moshe is a baby, he's put into a little box and allowed to float on the Nile. 
Well, what day is that? So Moshe is born on the seventh day of Adar, and his mother's able to hide him for three months. What's three months later? The sixth day of Sivan. So actually, the day that Moshe is floating on the Nile as a baby is actually the same day, 80 years prior to Moshe being the leader of the Jewish people, who are now outside of Egypt, at signing again in the Torah. What happened to Moshe on that day? So the Torah describes how his sister's watching him, and Moshe is picked up by Pharaoh's daughter, and she wants to adopt him, and he refuses to eat to nurse from any Egyptian woman. And his daughter, I'm sorry, Moshe's sister, suggests, well, why don't we find a Jewish woman to nurse Moshe? And that, of course, is Moshe's mother, and she ends up to get paid for it. Not bad to get paid to nurse your own baby. Uh, but because that happened on this day, and Moshe, that we kind of remember that miracle that Moshe is being nursed by his mom in this just incredible twist of events that happened. And of course, now it's we, 80 years later, Moshe is a leader of Jewish people, and he is giving us the Torah. So again, that's an, uh, there's more answers given. As well, there's a custom to de- decorate the, sh- the shul and decorate the house with flowers and various other sorts of greenery, which is why that there is a, a custom to go make flowers and have lots of those things uh, before Shavuos. And finally, there is a custom to stay up the entire night and to study. And the reason for that is because on the morning of Shavuos, God had to wake up the Jewish people that were sleeping in order to make up for that every generation subsequently we say we're going to make up and we're going to stay up the whole night to prepare for the giving of the torah in the morning now the question may be asked why do the nation sleep in why were they sleeping why did they have to be woken up by god and the answer to that i heard a fantastic answer is that three days before sinai moshe tells them to get ready and they were so excited and they couldn't sleep and therefore for three days they were up but the Talmud says that the maximum someone could stay up without falling asleep is three days. That for three days after they were told that they're about to have communion with God, prophecy from God and Sinai, they were up for three days with anticipation, but then after three days, they had to fall asleep. They never had to be woken up. But regardless, that's why they went to sleep. But we stay up in order and study Torah to bring in this day and this celebration with actualization of it. And uh, my hope for all of us is that we are able to relive and revisit spiritually a little bit of the experience that we had at Sinai at the foot of the mountain many, many years ago to once again reach at the Torah anew this year and to deepen our relationship with our Creator through Torah and uh, to hopefully integrate some of the lessons of the festival and to to revisit them, to think about them, to ruminate upon them, and to try to integrate them as much as we can in preparation for accepting the Torah and continuing on throughout the year, influenced by those ideals, concretizing those experiences. Chag